you can watch news night and see a Tory minister, uh, you know, the party that introduced Section 28, one of the most viciously hammered by the piece of legislation, arguing for gay marriage against the Catholic Church. And, of course, in January, we saw the landmark uh, conviction of two of Stephen Lawrence's uh, killers, a massive victory for Stephen Lawrence's family for anti-racist campaigners who fought the determined campaign for justice. Uh, but we also then see he's been toasted by the establishment as if this has somehow nothing to do with this gay racism and gay uh, pedal. And I think that all of these things are illustrative on the one hand of real shifts and gains that have been made in a struggle against oppression. The fact that women can be hit so hard in terms of job cuts in the public sector reflects the fact that women are no longer so narrowly tied economically and socially uh, to their role in the planet that make up almost half of the workforce and a very powerful part of that sector. 5% of those who took strike action on November 30th were women. The fact that Tories can talk about supporting uh, gay marriage reflects a huge shift in terms of what is being achieved around popular opinion in terms of LGBT rights, but also the confidence of LGBT people to assert themselves. I think the importance of the example of Stephen Lawrence, though, is that actually key to achieving these shifts have been the immense struggles that people have had to wage, generally in the face of opposition, and repression by the same elements of the establishment would like to, that would like to claim uh, credit for them. And I think that the point about this is that it also points to the limits of what has been achieved as well, that women may make up almost 50% of the workforce, but we know that there is a 15.5% pay gap, that two-thirds of people on the minimum wage are women, and that women are still concentrated in particular jobs and in, in part-time part work. And that reflects the fact that women continue to be the primary carer in the home, but it's also part of a wider the pattern of sexism and discrimination faced by women. For example, you look at the university campuses, we've seen an increase in sexual assaults and quite rampant sexist ideas now being expressed. I don't know if people saw the UniLad Facebook page, over 100,000 likes on it, which had uh, people saying things like this, seeing as the conviction rates for rape are so low as a man, you have a pretty good odds with a girl who won't spread. And uh, only last week we saw Cambridge Union inviting Dominic Strauss-Kahn uh, to do a keynote uh, speech. And I think the point about this, really, is whether it's racism, sexism or homophobia, there is a pattern of discrimination and prejudice based on certain characteristics, be it gender, skin colour, sexuality, but also religious affiliation, national origin, disability. And this pattern, which we call oppression, remains a structural and central feature of today's society. In the current period of cuts and crisis of polarisation, you can see the dangers of those oppressions being intensified and renewed. I'm sure people read the reports about people with disabilities saying that there's been an increase of, of attacks, of hatred expressed towards them. Any surprise when we are constantly told these people are scroungers and don't deserve their, their benefit? And in order to understand the persistence, the vicious energy with which oppression survives and recreates itself, the limit of what has been achieved by some oppressed groups despite in some cases winning formal political and legal equality, we have to look at the context, the economic and social relationships which shape the person and the historical conditions in which they are generated. And I think this is really important because the way that capitalism functions in general is a way in which makes everything from the market to economic crisis appear as natural and as eternal as the weather, without history, without a beginning, and therefore without an end. And within that process, oppression and inequality are continually naturalised as stemming from innate, eternal, biological, but also cultural uh, differences. And in recent years, we've seen a resurgence of biologically determinist ideas that put inequalities between men and women uh, down to genes. You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, uh, but also you see feminists you know, seeking to challenge rather than reinforce those inequalities, often relying on theories which in various ways posit men's traits and intentions to cause of women's oppression. And the Marxist approach is a very different one. We argue you have to avoid projecting um, the, uh, the, 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 the present inequality and oppression that exists as some kind of back into history as if it's some kind of universal feature of human nature or society. Rather, we have to look at the historical and material conditions that produce and reproduce unequal relationships, oppression and the ideas that accompany them. And in order to do that, we think that you have to uh, look at in each society how human beings organise to meet their basic needs because this forms the fundamental basis of any human society, the core institutions, the social relationships and the ideas which people form. 
And really, within this pr approach, Marxists are able to show that oppression has not always existed, but also the key to understanding the rise of oppression is the division of society into classes. The division between an exploiting class whose wealth and power stems from the exploitation of the labour of the exploited. And in particular, how under capitalism, uh, the most ruthlessly exploitative class system of all, this process gives rise to a whole series of institutions, ideas and divisions which generates oppression and regenerate it on a daily basis. And what I want to do is show that in relation to women's oppression and then draw out some general uh, conclusions. Because really it was using this approach that Frederick Engels, who was a close comrade of, of, of Karl Marx, uh, wrote a path-breaking book uh, on the origins of women's oppression where he was able to really use historical evidence to show that for a large part of history, women's oppression had not existed and that equality between the sexes had been the norm. But what he also argued is that what underpins that equality was that those societies were based on relatively small groups of people having to cooperate very closely in order to survive. And that close cooperation formed the basis of equality between all members of the community and found its counterpart in the lack of any formal family structure or restrictive regulation between the sexes or ideas about gender. Children, for example, were considered uh, the responsibility of the whole community, not just the responsibility of the biological uh, parents. And the labour before performed by men and women was seen as of equal value. And he identified in terms of the rise of women's oppression, which he called the world historical defeat of the female sex in the change that took place in the material base in society that led to the first class divisions in human history. And this really stemmed from the development of a surplus in society over and above what was necessary for survival, a material advance, but that one that could only uh, benefit a small minority. And it was those whose position in production gave them control of that surplus that over time crystallised into an exploiting class whose wealth and position depending, depended on maintaining control of that surplus and ensuring the continued production of that surplus by the exploited class. And it is at this point that the biological differences between men and women take on an importance that they have never had before. Women's role in reproducing the labour which will produce the surplus, surplus becomes of primary importance and women become increasingly marginal to production and public life. And this under undermines the interdependent relationship that existed between men and women. And at the same time, women in the ruling class are increasingly treated as the property of ruling class men who require their monogamy, their isolation from wider society, in order to ensure that they will bear the legitimate children who they can pass their wealth on to, thus keeping the wealth inside of the hands of the ruling, of the ruling class. And it's really in, in, the, in the fires of this process that the institution of the privatised family as a structure which was separated from wider society and which enshrined the subordination of women to men uh, developed and generalised across society enforced by a range of elaborate rules, laws and ideas. And really Engels really draw out how it was the economic processes at the core but that then led to the most brute sexism and oppression of women. He put it like this. He said, the man took command in the home also. The woman was degraded and reduced to servitude. She became a slave of his lust and a mere instrument for the production of children. In order to make the wife's fidelity and therefore the paternity of his children, she was delivered over unconditionally into the power of the husband. If he kills her, he is only exercising his rights. So, to summarise, women's oppression has not existed for all time. The rise of women's oppression is rooted in the shift from a society geared towards collectively meeting people's needs on an equal basis to one geared towards maintaining the wealth, interests and position of the exploiting class. Uh, the oppression of women and the institutionalisation of that oppression in the privatised family was not driven by the desire of men to subordinate women, but the desire of the exploiting class to maintain control over the surplus. And it involved not just the brute subordination of all women to that process, but also the subordination of men who were part of that exploited class. Now, what you have with the rise of capitalism is you have a system that is more dynamic than ever before, driven by the competition by capitalists to accumulate. And because of this dynamic, initially capitalism appeared to be quite a progressive force that would clear away uh, women's, women's oppression because in order to establish itself it had to wipe away many of the prejudices, the institutions, the caste systems that had held the previous system, feudalism, together and which kind of stood in the way and its way of establishing itself as a new economic system. But what you see really is that ruthless drive for profit 
see the capitalists in the end taking hold of some of the most backward features of the old society and remoulding them to serve their interests. And at the same time, you see that system beginning to give birth to a range of new oppressions as well. The racism that came out of the slave trade, homophobia as well. And I want to look at what happened in relation to the family and women's oppression because initially the old family which had been rooted in, in, in relationships and units working on the land around small scale domestic production began to completely disintegrate as men, women and children are forced off the land and drawn into growing urban areas, atomised by a labour market that forced them to compete with each other for work and whereby the capitalists seeking to cheapen their labour costs start to employ women and children as well. And Marx and Engels thought that initially capitalism would end the family, that it would begin to open up the possibility for the end of women's oppression, drawing women back into the public sphere, drawing them into the work, workplace where, where they have they could exercise a collective, a collective power. But the capitalist class as a whole soon began to see this breakdown of the family as a real problem because of the way it undermined the very basis of further capital accumulation. In other words, the reproduction of the working class. Because that general immiseration of workers and that <coughs> breakdown of the family had a dramatic impact on the health and mortality rates of workers. Just one example, in Liverpool an inquiry showed that the life expectancy for machine operatives was but 15 years. The obvious solution to this, of course, would have been drawing on the new surplus, the profits that were being created to provide common support for everyone. Mass childcare, improved housing, better working conditions, paid maternity leave, but this was a problem for the capitalist thinking in narrow terms and they saw a cheaper alternative in rebuilding the family, in pushing the cost of reproduction onto the private sphere which, within which women would, would carry the main uh, burden. And I think it's also important to point out that the family came to be seen as quite a useful institution in maintaining social <coughs> control at a time where there was great fear of unrest because you know, in order to function, it requires a deference to hierarchy and discipline, something that the family had played an important role in driving uh, through. But as that was being undermined, you also see the character of the exploited class changing. Workers now being drawn together collectively in mass numbers, giving rise to new forms of organisation and struggle. The strike, the union, the mass movement, women playing a leading role in this, alongside socialists, began to agitate for a society which would free workers not only from the shackle of exploitation, but from the shackle of oppression as, of, as well. And this idea of pushing people back into the privatised home, placing the burden of individual family duties and responsibilities, was seen as an important way of undermining that radicalism, those new forms of collective organisation and of individualising social problems. And so you have a whole set of bribes, reforms, repressive measures being driven through by the capitalist class to enforce a very narrow form of the family to push women back into the home. And this is reinforced ideologically by a whole set of ideas that promote the notion of women's place being in the home, undermining women's independence, not just economically, but her whole being. You know, she's forced and pressured to conform to a very narrow idea in terms of her sexuality and her gender. I think it's important to say that the family is not just something imposed, it's not just some big capitalist conspiracy, you know, for many workers it seemed to be a solution too. Conditions of living were very hard and, you know, for many people it seemed like the family was the best way to achieve a decent standard of living, a vital crutch in hard times, but also an escape from the hell of urban life and, uh, and working life. And, you know, the, the, the pressure and alienation of life under capitalism meant that people did seek in the family a kind of heart in, in, the heartless, in the heartless world. The problem is, is that the form of the family that came to dominate was a very backward step, you know, which really encouraged the idea of women's place being in the home rather than the workplace, the movement, or in the struggle, <coughs> as close to say outside. And that really undercut the ability of workers to fight for a general raising of wages and conditions, uh, for the state to provide proper childcare, and enabled the ruling class to heap, heap, uh, heap huge burdens onto working class families. What I'm trying to draw out here is you see how, again, you know, in the, in the pursuit of profit, really, uh, uh, in a very ruthless way, the capitalist class are prepared, therefore, to bring in the old elements and prejudices from the old society and reshape it in their, in their interests and reinstitute uh, the family and, and very backward ideas about women as well. I want to bring it up to date before I summarise because I think clearly things have changed enormously uh, since then. You know, uh, we can't really say that the idea of the man as a breadwinner and the woman as a homemaker really 
fit because I mean women have always had to work but now they are an absolutely central part of the of the workforce and I think this is being part of a fundamental shift in terms of women's economic political and social role in society and expectations that women have about their lives and about the views uh, that society has as a whole as well. And I think this has undoubtedly led to a reshaping of the family. I don't know if people saw the survey the other week, 50% of people now say they don't think that they live in conventional uh, families. And I think really at the root of this process is, is once again the very way in which competition for profit leads to a continual restructuring of capitalism, of how things are produced, who makes up the workforce, the level of state intervention in maintaining and reproducing the labour force, and that central to this process has been drawing women more and more into the, into the workplace. It's important to say this has not just been an economic process, so this has been one that has been shaped by huge social, uh, uh, political and class struggles in which people have fought for the terms on which those changes have taken uh, place. You know, the big leaps forward uh, for women's liberation in the 60s and 70s were shaped by a period of wars, the expansion of women into the workforce education, but they were driven forward by political and class struggles as, uh, as well. And there's no doubt they have achieved an enormous amount, but I think what you see once again is those achievements coming up against the limits of a system based on the ruthless drive for profit, based on exploitation. Because as much as the capitalists want women's labour to be available to exploit, as a class as a whole, they are not prepared to put the investment uh, that will be required to socialise all those things that are done inside of the family. And that's not just because capitalism puts profits first, it's also because the system is crisis prone as well. You know, the establishment of the welfare state, for example, was a response to struggles from below and also concessions made by capital, which were seen as beneficial to them to a degree in contributing to its needs for a fit, healthy, educated uh, well, uh, workforce. But what you really see in the current phase of neoliberalism and the attempt to deal with declining profit rates is, is a drive to claw back some of that public uh, provision in those areas and open up new areas for capital accumulation in the form of privatisation and marketisation. And what we're seeing now in the context of economic crisis is that drive becoming more vicious, a drive that will have a massive impact in terms of pushing responsibilities onto uh, individuals, onto families and particularly onto women. And it means however significant the changes that have taken place, you know, the facts are that 93% of childcare costs are borne by the family. The facts are that £6 billion, it is estimated, is saved every year on unpaid care work done largely by women looking after the elderly and the, and the young. And of course, all of this means that for many people, the family is the only uh, source of support that they have uh, in hard times. It's a place that people still look to uh, for solidarity and it can be very, very important for us. But it also means that the family can be a real pressure cooker as well pressures to carry out uh, these things, you know, to do the work, to do the best uh, by your kids. And also it is a place where often things break down in, in the most uh, horrible way as well. You know, it's the place where uh, rapes takes place, where domestic violence uh, takes place, where those distortions can, ex uh, can, can, can explode as well. But I think that the, the fact that women continue to shoulder the burden in terms of the infirmities, also what carries through in terms of those structural inequalities of women in the workplace that I talked about earlier, limiting the kind of jobs that women are able to access, the hours that they can work, and acting as a justification for that inequality at the same time. And I think it's in this, back, in this context that you can really also see the persistent importance of the families and ideological cement for the ruling class, you know, at a time of increasing cuts. You know, so I wonder that Cameron is putting forward the idea about the big society, family, individuals stepping into areas where the state support has been with, with, withdrawn, but also actually failing families, so-called, as a scapegoat for growing levels of inequality, unemployment, social problems. The riots blame parents who don't discipline their children, not racism, not inequality, not our cuts. And actually these are things that we're really building on what New Labour did. If you think about the whole kind of social policies around New Labour, really driving and blaming social problems on, on, on you know, failing families, families with ASBO kids, families who live on benefits, families who live on housing estates, and so on. I think it's also the case that, that the drive of capital to penetrate every area of our life has given a real visceral energy to the increasing commodification of relations between men and women, commodification of sex and sexuality and women's bodies. So, you know, we've seen stripping and sex clubs entering the mainstream of the entertainment industry in the form of lap dancing clubs and other, other venues. We see women's bodies 
used in the crudest of ways to sell all manner of goods, whether it's dressed as mannequins in high street stores, or as the case where I walked into a freshers' fair at Leeds University, a woman posited in a huge cardboard cutout uh, of a man's uh, jean pocket to sell Lynx uh, deodorant. And, you know, at every level, women being bombarded with body-enhancing goods, treatments, surgeries, all these things that are considered essential to our success. And these are part of a seepage of the most crude sexism, not just into everyday life, but into some of the very organisations that used to pride themselves on anti-sexist policies and actions. Student unions now host pimps and horse nights. They, uh, you know, they raise charity by having Playboy bunny nights and selling naked uh, calendars. And I think partly why this is able to happen is because really what we've seen is capitalism setting about commodifying something else. And that is the very idea of women's liberation. So in these different ways, these things are sold to us either as a form of empowerment that women and men should embrace, or as a kind of iron ironic parody of a sexism that doesn't seriously exist anymore, so we can all just have a bit of a, a, bit of a laugh about it. And I think this is symptomatic of a wider shift really, where big business and governments alike really use the language of equality and women's liberation <coughs> to promote the supposedly progressive credentials of the enterprise, of free market capitalism, of Western democracy. You know, so Cameron attacks multiculturalism as an affront to British values of equality. The French state bans the hijab and persecutes Muslim women under the guise of, guise of defending women's autonomy. And brutal wars are waged in the Middle East uh, supposedly in the interest of women's uh, liberation. And I think this is a very significant uh, shift, really, because whereas Thatcher once said, I owe nothing to women's liberation, we now have the phenomenon of Tory feminism. You know, Tory MPs donning proud to be feminist uh, T-shirts, and a call from Tories for a feminism in the words of Louise Mensch, which refuses to stigmatise the profit motive, as that stigmatises women's ability to get on and to break the bus ceiling. Now, I think, of course, partly this is sheer opportunism on the part of senior Tories really worried about the, their unpopularity amongst women. But I think that the notion of feminism being about an individual empowerment and advancement as opposed to a kind of radical challenge uh, to the collective structures of women's oppression is part of a wider trend that we've seen within some feminist sort, which actually has a deeper material root. And that really is in the existence of a significant layer of women in society whose class position in society, gives them a stake in the current system and actually sets them apart from the conditions and experiences of the vast majority of working class women. It's <coughs> quite incredible when you look just in a decade between the 1970s and the 1980s where you have lots of women entering into jobs in the public sector, the service sector, you also see a dramatic leap in terms of minority of women really <coughs> moving up into the higher echelons in, in, into society, really moving into high powered, high paid jobs, managerial positions and all these kinds of things. Now, you know, being well off doesn't mean that you don't experience uh, women's, uh, women's oppression. You, know, you look at some of the gross sexual harassment cases taken out by women in the city or the way in which even women in the, in the highest positions of power are continually trivialised. You know, oppression does cut across uh, class, but I think it's also important to be clear that class does mitigate against many of the factors that lie at the core of women's oppression. Because put simply, if you have economic power, you can buy yourself out of childcare or the care responsibilities. You are in a more of a position to negotiate a good deal in the workplace. And often this is done by hiring women in some of the poorest paid and least respected jobs, you know, getting a cleaner, getting a nanny in order to do so. And in that context, it's easy to see where individual advancement or equality at the higher echelons of society kind of makes sense. But as a strategy for the majority of working class women, it is a total dead end. There's a really good article written by a woman called Joanna Brenner who, who says, hitting your head on the glass ceiling is not the same as falling into the basement. And this is why, for Marxists, class is important, not just as a means of understanding the root of oppression, but in shaping a strategy for how we fight and then locating where the power lies to smash it. Uh, there was a, a, a woman, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Finn, who was involved in the unionising drives in America in the early 20th century, who put it like this. She said, the queen of the parlour has nothing in common with the maid in the kitchen. The wife of a department store owner shows no sisterly concern for the 17-year-old gar girl who finds prostitution the only door open to her. The sisterhood of women, like the brotherhood of men, is a hollow sham to labour. <coughs> Behind all its smug hypocrisy and sickly sentimentality are the sinister outlines 
of class war. And I think that we're at a historical point now where the sinister outlines of class war are actually a lot clearer, because despite the success in achieving a range of civil, economic and political rights, it hasn't fundamentally altered the material conditions that create women's oppression. And whilst we've seen a period of a, um, a layer of women being able to access well-paid, powerful uh, positions, at the same time the drive uh, to increase exploitation, to claw back gains that have been made in the past, are actually pushing the conditions of working class men and women closer together. And so, you know, although the idea that men are beneficiaries of women's oppression can appear to fit reality at a superficial level, in practice, this is not the case at all. If you take any of those questions about pay, pay childcare, working hours inequalities, actually these things drive down the conditions of everyone. And the point about this is that working class men and women have an objective interest in building solidarity in the struggle against oppression. It's a solidarity that has to be won, but they have an objective interest in doing so, and they are key to waging an effective challenge to oppression. Because if we're going to break oppression, we have to break it at its root. And that is at the, where, the heart of where it stems from, uh, at the process of exploitation. And it's why historically, when the working class has been at its most combative, struggles against oppression have also risen and made the biggest gains. You know, you think about the 60s and the 70s and the major struggles for liberation. They were strengthened and able to make the impact that they did because they were part of a wider resistance raging at the time, the mass anti-war movement, the mass strikes across Europe, which put a revolutionary challenge to capitalism on the agenda and which began to weaken and shake all the institutions, the prejudices and the divisions on which capitalism uh, relies. And, you know, within those struggles, solidarity <coughs> had to be fought for. People striking didn't necessarily see why they should be committed to women's liberation. People raging against the war didn't necessarily be relevant of people fighting against their, their, their bosses. But where solidarity was won, and where those links were made, some of the most important advances uh, were, were won. You know, people might have seen the thing about the um, Made in Dagenham, the dispute the Fords uh, strike, led by women that was really key to lifting women's wages, to forcing the government to introduce the Pay Act, Equal Pay Act. Solidarity of men was very important in the success of that dispute. But it was also part of a wider process of winning a commitment across a significant section of the working class movement to fighting for women's rights that fed into later struggles. So when attacks on abortion came in the 1970s, mass mobilisation of workers through the trade unions, march of 100,000 people and so on, was absolutely key in stopping that anti-abortion bill. And I just think today, you know, faced with the biggest assault on workers for generations, which will not only have a vicious impact on women, but make all of our lives harder and poorer. I'm sure people have seen the stuff about George Osborne now coming for national pay, now saying people in poorer areas should be paid less. And by the way, while we're at it, we're going to get rid of the top rate of tax uh, at, at, while we're at it uh, as well. In that, in that context, really, I think you can see the need for those kind of struggles and solidarity uh, more important than ever. And that's why for us, disputes like the pension strikes are so important because they can begin to change the balance of forces in Britain. In scoring a victory against that, they can begin to open up a bigger front against the Tories and on austerity. And this can begin to open up other processes as well. The kind of processes we saw in the 60s and 70s and that you see every time people begin to struggle and fight back. Because what better way to strengthen our ability to begin to take on those massive inequalities than women at the heart of a strike movement where they're leading, organising and fighting back. What better antidote to the sexist crap that we're bombarded with than that experience of men and women coming together and asserting their collective pain. You know, you think about the Jeremy Clarks and stuff coming out with vile crap all the time in terms of uh, attacking gays, women, and, and so on. You know, he, he, he does the thing about all oh, public sector work should be taken out and shot. It creates an outrage, you know, because it jars with people's, with people's uh, experience. And I think that, you know, it's very important, though, to, uh, to recognise that as resistance develops, that it, it won't just develop in an upward, unbroken uh, trajectory, uh, and people won't automatically make the links between different struggles, that we have to fight hard to shape how those struggles, uh, struggles develop. And there's no question we've seen that very directly, how the question of the pensions, having to fight against the bureaucrats trying to sell it out, fight to keep the pensions uh, strike on, and of course we're going to have to really fight to shape a strategy around that that argues we've got to bring the full force of our class behind that uh, dispute. But it's also the case for revolutionaries that part of bringing the full force of our class to bear against 
their side means also engaging in a whole range of challenges and issues that have been thrown up in the period. And that means that fighting oppression has to be a central element of that. You know, you can see at the moment how the concerted <coughs> attack on multiculturalism, Muslims, asylum seekers are part of a racism being stirred up to divert anger, create attention, and undermine a collective response. And actually, in that context, the revolutionary argument about how we have to take on oppression, about why we have a common interest in uniting and fighting against it, can be very, very effective. And we have to find ways for how we do it. You know, Tony Cliff founding member of the SWP used to talk about a picket line. If you're on a picket line, what do you do if someone makes a sexist or a racist comment? Do you walk away in disgust? Break the strike. Do you ignore it? That's a bit opportunistic and surely we have to win people. No, you have to stand on the picket line and you have to argue and you use the opportunity of people who are moving into struggle over one particular issue or one particular injustice to begin to see the connection with the other injustices as well, to see the need to forge all of these things into a fight against capitalism into, in its totality, into the fight uh, for, for socialism. And Lenin uh, put it very well uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of this. He said that the socialist ideal should not be the trade union secretary, not the caricature, that we're only interested in you know, wages and, uh, 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 and conditions and so on. No, it should be the tribune of the people who is able to react to every manifestation of tyranny and oppression, no matter where it appears, no matter what stratum of people it affects, who is able to generalise all those manifestations and produce a single picture of police violence and capitalist exploitation, who is able to take advantage of every event, however small, in order to set forth before all his socialist convictions and democratic demands, in order to clarify for all and everyone the world historic, historical significance of the struggle for the emancipation of the working class. And just to conclude, the point about that is that is the method about how we relate to different struggles in this period and link them together. That it is not about, we are not about just the economic struggles and we're not about marginalising oppression. We're about building an organisation that is able to draw together anyone that trembles injustice, whatever that injustice is, if it is about inequality, if it is about sexism, if it is about racism, but also building an organisation that recognises the needs to meld those fights together and focus a strategy on where the power lies, not just to stand up to injustice, but to wage a revolutionary struggle against capitalism, and in the process, lay the foundation for society without classes, without exploitation and without oppression. And this is what Rosa Luxemburg meant, a uh, leading revolutionary Germany in the early 20th century, when she said, where the chains of capitalism are forged, there they must be broken. Only that is socialism, and only thus can socialism be created. I mean, just, just picking up on a few things, I think the stuff that was uh, talked about in terms of the TUC conference stuff is really interesting because it, it does show how that kind of brand, brand of, kind of, that brand of feminism, uh, you know, sucked out of any real meaning is seeped into elements of the labour movement and stuff uh, uh, as well, and that it's absolutely right, it is this notion that, you know, men are to blame, and let's just talk about women's issues, and women are vi as victims as well, is, is incredibly uh, disempowering and takes people away from, you know, discussing how we, how we build unity in the battles, but also you can see how it's a cover. You know, so it's all very well to say men are the problem, but if you want to actually have a go at Dave Prentice so over something that's real and meaningful in terms of the key attack that we, t that, that we, that we face, then you're not allowed to do that and you're, and you're and attacked for it. And it's a similar kind of approach. I mean, the LGBT TUC conference was actually held during the, um, the June 30th public sector strikes. No mention of the strikes to it whatsoever. So all this stuff about, you know, isn't it terrible in terms of how things are going to affect LGBT people? When it, but when it talks to actually asserting a, a serious political response on class power, people didn't want to know about it uh, at, at, at all. And I think that the point about it for us, though, is that what it means is that for us, you know, we have, to, we have a strategy that is about actually, you know, taking on a sexism in our movement and that you can take it on and you can win it. I'm glad that the comrade spoke uh, there about her experience, you know, and women and so on, because the point is, when you do that, actually you win people uh, around it. I think the point is that partly for us, it's about recognising that, you know, it's not just a commitment to, to women's liberation equality. Isn't it? We don't just want token words. It's actually about how you understanding you have to go through a process in the movement to actually win people to actually win people, to actually win people over, and I think the kind of stuff that Sarah talked about is really important because I think it isn't always straightforward. There's been a number of examples now on the campuses where you have 
uh, instances of, of, of sexual, sexual harassment and assaults and stuff. And you have to think about how do you relate that in, in, in a way that starts to shift the atmosphere on the campus, but also doesn't just reduce it down to an atmosphere of fear or that men are the problem, but starts to relate it to those broader questions as well in terms of what is the source of these things and how can we start to address it in a concrete way. And certainly one of the things that we did at Sussex University, where this happened recently, where there was a, there was a number of sexual assaults, the woman that was then arrested for um, wasting police time, the other one was told there was no evidence, the usual stuff in terms of the police, but the comrades really thought about how to organise a political, a political response to it. And they had a meeting around it, and then they called a demonstration on International Women's Day, which kind of linked some of the local issues about how the, the centre had been closed down at the university, which meant you couldn't report it, how the university management were more interested in hushing it up, because now it's all about how universities market themselves, and so, you know, they don't want to deal with these kinds of <coughs> questions. But they also invited someone from the UCU that was taking strike action to come and talk about the disputes. In other words, thinking through quite carefully about how you link up the concrete issues to the broader, to the broader questions. And just a couple of other things. I'm glad that the, um, the comrades spoke from, um, from South Africa, because actually that is a really, really brilliant example of what we talk about in terms of how, you know, as, as people begin to struggle, so many things begin to get thrown up into the air in terms of undermining all kinds of, all kinds of divisions. And, you know, if you look at that fight that was waged in terms of South Africa to overthrow apartheid, you know, what it took really was a mass unified struggle that linked together the townships, the unemployed, rooted in the, in the, workers, in the workers' movement. And it was a process that, yes, overthrew apartheid, and undermine racism, but also began to undermine all those kinds of other divisions as well in terms of women leading the struggle in terms of South Africa being the first country that introduced the, um, the, the constitution in terms of LGBT, LGBT equality in the world. The problem with it is, in terms of problems that she talked about, is actually that country was brought to the brink of revolution. That revolution wasn't realised, and since then you've seen a whole series of games and things unravel in this country. And this, this brings me to the question about the revolutionary alternative, because you talked about, you know, um, the, the, the socialist approach, about what is the alternative. You know, it's about attacking the thing at its roots and recognising that really the only real way that you can begin to undo oppression is by people taking collective and democratic control over their labour, gearing society's resources to people's needs, and in that process, beginning to undermine all those other fissures and divisions uh, that, that, that exploitation uh, creates. And that was the example of the Russian Revolution. I'm not sure whether they collectivised washing up, but there was a whole process of, you know, uh, you know, providing collective childcare, food halls, you know, actually taking practical measures to enable women to come out of the home, going out into the, into the rural areas, teaching women literacy, giving women the tools to be able to uh, participate equally in the revolutionary process. And some fantastic things, even just, you know, writing poems and songs to take out into areas to actually undermine those deep prejudices that have been ingrained in the kind of peasant, peasant households, a real conscious attempt to undermine, to undermine the, uh, to undermine the, the uh, to undermine the, um, the oppression, and that's why for me, just to finish up, I meant to come back on it. But in terms of stuff about the, the, the woman about feminism, you see, the thing, the thing for me, what matters is, is about you know how we respond to that kind of situation, and you know what, how she can be part of building a, a campaign, because. As much as I think uh, that you can see in the current period that there's lots of people coming into uh, feminism, calling themselves feminists, as a, as an, a reaction and anger towards towards sexism and women's and women's oppression. You know, I think the part, partly what I've tried to draw out is a strategy simply based on gender, on the basis that we're all in it together as women against men, is not a useful strategy at all. And you have to say, what kind of feminism are we talking about? Are we talking about the feminism of, of Theresa May and Louise Lynch? You know, what does that mean? And so for me, I would much rather we try to win her into Swiss and so she says she's a revolutionary uh, socialist. You know, it's not I'm opposed to calling themselves feminists, but then we have to say, okay, that's fine as a, as a, as a, as a the thing about, you know, not being treated as a doormat, I'm angry about sexism. But if we want to talk about what we're calling ourselves in terms of a real political strategy that can actually effectively fight oppression and reshape the world where we don't have oppression, then that, that's an argument about why actually in the current period, as new struggles are beginning to rise again against all kinds of things, including oppression. This time around, we actually want to win. And for me, that means we don't need more feminists. We need, we need more revolutionary socialists. And that's the fight that we've got to take into these arguments and struggles that are beginning to develop and emerge.